Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography, coming to you live um, on an infrared camera. Uh, I figured that uh, that would be a suitable thing to do, given the um, the topic of the show tonight. Um, we've um, got an absolutely fantastic and very inspiring, or personally inspiring guest uh, for me tonight, um, Peter Hill, um, and um, we can't wait to talk to him about um, infrared and um I guess, uh, you know, everything about his background and what he's done uh, in infrared. Uh, and also, I mean, he's a very capable black and white photographer as well. You'll see that there's a pretty strong crossover between black and white and infrared. Um, yeah, so really exciting show. And it's certainly one that I'm, I'm a big fan of infrared. I've, I've been wanting to do this show since the show started. So uh, it's very fulfilling for me to, for us to be here tonight. Um, Paulie, how you been going? You've been on a bit of an adventure. Yeah, um, Uncle Travelling Paul's been, uh, as my uh, nephew, niece and nephew's uh, <laughs> he's been living up to his reputation. I, I, I'm i sorry, not sorry, I missed the show last week. I, um, I actually used to be a guide on the Overland Track, so, so it's a very, very special part of the world to me that, uh, that Nick and Luke were um, sharing last week and, and a place very dear to my heart. But I um, I was offered an invitation to to do a 10-day um, a sailing trip through the, the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef and uh, help prepare a friend's boat for um, for sea trials to, to get it back to Tasmania. And I've been swimming with uh, green turtles and dodging dodging big waves and uh, uh, getting shoaled up on reefs that, and on midnight sails and <laughs> having all sorts of adventures. And I managed to make it back uh, on shore. I think one of the highlights for me was a place called Lady Musgrave Island, which is pretty much the very southern tip it's the second island up from the very southern tip of the, of the great barrier reef and it's has an incredible population of, of birds there must be 10 or fifteen thousand birds on an island that you can walk around in 20 minutes and i had the most incredible experience with just the the vivacity of life and also death so the nobbies that live there uh, are migratory birds and apparently last season they didn't um they, they didn't get the right conditions to fly. So they're overpopulated this year. There's this incredible experience of, of huge amount of life. And everywhere you go, there's, there's, there's the death of these birds at the same time. And they look like they're in perfect health. So it's quite a powerful sort of spiritual experience. Obviously, I, I was shooting a lot of it and documenting as much of it as I could. And uh, not being an underwater photographer, I, uh, I'm just going to have to burn the 10-minute uh, the swims I had side by side with turtles in my memory and my soul, which is, uh, which is fine by me. And the green turtles are, are rare and endangered, and, and this is one of the main places that they nest. And literally, the night we arrived was the very start of, of their nesting. And the first couple of turtles came up, and you can literally see uh, the trails of the sand and, and the beautiful um, scooped out sort of hollows where they lay, I think, 125 eggs like um, per female. So it's a powerful elemental experience the last 10 days. And I've, I've come back to shore now. And I'm slowly, uh, slowly the land's stopping to wobble. <laughs> and, uh, and as we got out of uh, the sea, obviously we we're way out of range of anything. All of a sudden to find out uh, the southern, southern Tasmania is in lockdown. So I was like, well, I could stay up here in the Queensland sun or I could come back and stare at the four walls of my house. So uh, that wasn't a tough choice for me. So, uh, so I won't apologise for that one. And I was sort of quietly not going to be too stressed if it carried on but we've actually popped out so it was really literally only three day lockdown so now i'm just dragging my feet uh well, i have picked up a little bit of work um, i was working the last two days for a, a paddle sports company doing um beautiful sort of drone work and and out of the out of the water sort of shooting different sort of craft and and uh, beautiful fast moving surf skis and um a little bit of wind sailing what do you call it kites kite surfing sort of stuff so it's it's been pretty fun and I'm catching up with a few local photographers here in Queensland, which is which I always love to do wherever I go. And at the moment, my uh, my latest ticket is Saturday, so we'll, we'll see how we go. There you go. <laughs> but, um, I, I've, watched, I've watched Lukey from afar with his infrared over the years, and and it's one of the one of the first things I ever saw of Luke's work was one of his images that uh, that took out image of the year and in, in the International Landscape Took of the Year Awards, which is a very prestigious award. And, and it's a place that, that I know as well. So it really, really struck me to, to view the world in a different way through a different technique because so powerfully really, really struck me. 
I haven't quite gone down the path of converting my cameras, but but and, but I certainly spent a lot of time doing black and white. So I'm very interested to hear um, from from Peter tonight, who's, who's who's one of the masters of that technique in, in Australia, and and is very highly revered in that regard. And, and both be inspired and ed- educated about it if I, if I choose to follow that path sort of more directly, um, how to be empowered to do so. Mm, and yeah, well, Peter um, was a massive, massive inspiration for me to get into infrared photography from the start. So it's really nice for it to come full circle tonight and, and um, hear a bit about uh, Peter and Peter's background, I suppose, or how he got into it. And, and um, we'll also be able to cover off some of the more technical aspects as well around um uh, infrared photography uh, it's definitely a great technique for people to get into because um, you know if you've got a spare camera lying around uh, and you don't know what to do with it often it's not worth selling you could actually consider getting it converted and and I'm um, that's how I, I guess got into it initially um, although I, I converted an a7r camera um, which is what I'm uh, on now well my first conversion sorry was a 5d mark ii uh, and then I knew that I really loved infrared and went to an a7r so um yeah, it's not not necessarily super cheap, but um, the, it can be very effective and, and it's pretty niche. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see the images tonight, and, and you can judge for yourself whether it's worth giving it a go. I, I think that's probably a good way of putting it. Um, brilliant. Well, thanks for the update, Paul. Um, I think what we'll do is just um, introduce Peter now. Um, how are you, Peter? And, and welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. Oh, thank you, Luke. I'm I'm very well. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And. Um, you know, um, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you got into photography to start with, um, you know, how long you've been shooting for and, and how long you've been photographing in infrared. Um, well, photography um, started for me when I was in my teens and I noticed a camera a magazine in the, in the news agent. It was um, a magazine called American Photography. And there was a photograph, black and white photograph, actually, of um, Yosemite taken by Ansel Adams. And uh, we're talking mid-70s here. I'm giving away my age a a little bit. But that got me um, basically hooked. And then I, um, by the time I was uh, 18, I'd bought my first uh, camera. It was Olympus OM-1 film camera. Um, And with that camera, I, I went to the Himalayas a few times. And uh, I was shooting uh, slide film a lot, <clears throat> um, mostly colour. Um, then I uh, got married and then had kids and got a career and photography was just sort of put aside apart from, you know, family shots and holiday photos. And then when uh, the digital world started, my kids had grown up and um i i got back into photography in quite quite a big way um and i bought a canon 10d (laughs) which was a uh, a spare camera for a wedding photographer and uh, i joined this website called redbubble which is still around but back back in those days and we're talking about 2008 2009 now it was very much a community of um, photographers. The, very tight um, community. I know that some people like Mika Boynton and, and those yep. kind of guys got involved in that, yeah. Yep, absolutely. And, I mean, there are people I met on that website that I actually count as friends in real life. Um, so it was a great community, and this is before the venture capitalists took it, took it over and commercialised it. But um, on that website uh, was a gentleman by the name of Hans Kawitsi, and um, he's from Victoria and he started showing some infrared, black and white infrared photos that he was shooting on a point and shoot camera that he'd had converted. And I was um, absolutely mem- mesmerised by it. Um, and around the same time, the 5D Mark II came out and um, I got, I was an early adopter of the 5D Mark II. I got mine actually in 2008 and so I sent, my 10D off to get converted and haven't looked back. And mm. for the last couple of years now, I've been using the 5D2. That, that, um, so abs- that you eventually upgraded to a different camera and then you, the 5D2 that you did have, then that, that became your new infrared body after that? No, a, um, a mate of mine um, who always likes to have the, the latest and the greatest gear um, started seeing my um, IR photos, and so he he actually bought a five D 
to brand new and had it converted from oh, new. Wow. And he used it for about a week and said, oh, this is not for me. Do you want to buy my camera? So wow. <laughs> I bought it off him. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, the 5D2 loves loves infrared, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, and it, I mean, I, I have had first-hand experience myself with the 5D2 and the IR, and it's, yeah, it's a brilliant set up and, and a lot of the Canon lenses also perform quite well in infrared as well, which um, unfortunately isn't the same with Sony. Um, I guess we can talk a bit about hotspots and some of the more technical challenges um, with infrared because um, yep. there's a, probably a few traps for young players there that they wouldn't be aware of. Yep. Um, yeah. So, and so you um, got into it via the Canon. What, what um, lenses were you using initially for infrared? Uh, initially, I was using um, uh, the EF 24-70, to um, but that started to develop the hotspot issue. Um, I was using a 70-200, to 200, um, a 70-300, to 300, but that was also um, had a hotspot issue. Yeah. Um, and then I started using the tilt-shift lenses, uh, oh, Canon tilt-shift, yeah. uh, the original 24-millimetre. Um, um, which I subsequently upgraded to the uh, Mark II um, and the original 45 millimeter and the 90 millimeter. Um, the 45 millimeter in particular works very well um, on the infrared. It's as sharp as, and I, and I use these lenses with my normal uh, 1DS3 um, to shoot black and white anyway. So um, I've got my setup now is it, it doesn't matter what lens in, I've got in my bag, it will be, it will be ready for either the infrared camera or the normal uh, camera. <clears throat> That's, um, and I guess it's probably worth, um, since we've brought up hotspots, just to discuss that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. For those that aren't aware of hotspotting and infrared, um, my understanding, and feel free to correct me, Peter, is that um, lenses are obviously designed for the visible colour spectrum and infrared is actually not the visible colour spectrum. Um, to highlight that, um, I just turned the light off and you can see that there's very little change, maybe a little bit of extra fill light, but um, the, most of this is actually just the you know non-visible color coming through and so because the lenses aren't optimized for infrared then some lenses actually have a sort of a ghosting that you actually get in the in the center of the picture and um, it's much more noticeable if you stop the aperture down um, you'll, you'll the the spot will sort of uh, almost like coalesce or, or you know really concentrate in the middle and it's very very obvious and quite hard to remove in post-processing so for that reason um, you know there's actually known lenses that are very well performing in infrared and then there's known lenses that don't perform very well as yeah well. That's, that's that's true and the, the hot spots are created by um, the particular coating that's being used oh. on the inside of the lens barrel and with oh. IR, that becomes reflective. So it's 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 bouncing onto the, the sensor and creating that hotspot, which, mm. um, as you say, it's very, very hard to remove in, in um, post. Um, yeah, the best option you've got if you have it, and, and this lens has a, a small hotspot, but you can't see it because I've got it wide open. Um, so F1.8. Um, and, and that, But obviously, if you're doing landscapes and things like that, it's not terribly desirable to shoot wide no. open. Um, no. I believe infrared makes um, the images slightly softer as it is. And so um, then to be wide open on top of that, you're gonna end up, end up having a relatively soft image, but mm -hmm. um, at least um, you know that you can get around that. So there are actually databases online where you can actually see, uh, it actually says um, how well different lenses perform in infrared. I think um, <coughs> LifePixel might have one, Peter. Yeah, LifePixel is, uh, I would consider them to be the major player in converting um, cameras. Both of mine were converted by LifePixel in the US. There is, however, a, a business in Melbourne called Camera Clinic, mm. and they also do um, conversions and just were on, the, on those two. Um, the advantage of using Camera Clinic is that on their website they they reckon they can maintain your warranty manufacturer's warranty if it's a nikon or a leica um not if you're uh, it, it's a canon <clears throat> um, um and live pixel um, they also sell converted uh cameras 
LifePixel does have a page uh, on their website that details all the known um, lenses with hotspot issues for particular brands of camera. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Is there a resource to help people yep. yeah, figure that out? It's Great. really important. Um, I've heard um, people, um, they had a spare camera lying around and they, um, they thought, oh, I'll get it converted, uh, and they didn't um, check to see if a particular camera, and this was a, sometimes with a point-and-shoot as well, uh, and the point and shoot camera has a hot spot, and um, you know if the if the lens is baked into the camera like that, then then um, unfortunately it does render it pretty um, unusable. So, very very important to understand uh, in advance um, what you're sort of setting yourself up for. Uh, and certain kit, like we know the 5D Mark II is excellent. Um, and my understanding is the earlier models of Sony cameras and mirrorless work quite well. I, my A7 uh, Mark One works very well, but um, I've heard that. You know, um, when they started to get the um, inbuilt image stabilization and things like that, it's, it's not quite as good. So it uh, might be better to stick with some of the older older bodies in, in that regard. So, um, Robin just Robin just made a comment saying Kalari Vision with K in the states has two lists of lenses regarding hotspots, and they're polite yeah. to work with as well. Have you, have you heard of them, Peter? No. I've actually um, used Kalari. Um, I got my A7. So I've done three conversions in, in my life, and um, one was on a 5D Mark II, and then I, I got my A7R converted, and then I got it reconverted. Um, I went from a 720 nanometer filter to an 830 nanometer filter, um, and that was mainly because I wanted to get um, even more contrast. And so if you look at the visible um, color spectrum, um, which is something that I was hoping to bring up, but maybe um, I can bring that up a bit later, but basically... Uh, infrared is right at the the far end of the visible color spectrum. Um, I think like red uh, in the color spectrum finishes at about 700 nanometers or, or in that sort of ballpark. And then an infrared conversion um, sort of, the, the, I guess the stock standard one, 720 nanometers. Um, and that's so you're actually pulling off the hot mirror filter, which is on the front of the um, the sensor that, that is actually an IR blocking filter so that you don't have um, ghosting and other artifacts in, in, the, in the images that you take. And then it actually removes, you remove that and replace it with a filter that's actually blocking um, visible color spectrum and only letting the infrared in. Or at 720, it actually does let a little bit of visible through. And then 830, um, it's blocking a lot of the visible. Um, and so, and I, I think very, very little is actually getting through at all. It's one reason why at 720 nanometers, you can actually get, um, do false color. And so you can actually play a little bit with the different colors in the infrared image. Whereas at 830, you, you're generally just ending up with a black and white image um, as well. So um, there's varying benefits um, between the two conversions in that regard. Um, some folks will say it's better to get a full spectrum conversion, which means you don't have a hot mirror filter on there at all. And then you can actually pick and choose which filter to put over the top. So you can actually select your own um, uh, filtration um, as, as it goes. So that there's definitely different approaches. And of course, the other approach is to get a screw on filter to put on the front of your lens. Um, have you, did you ever experiment with screw-on filters at all, Peter? It sounded like you kind of went straight to the conversion um, option. Well, uh, the major advantage of getting a camera converted rather than putting it on the front of the lens uh, filter is that you can use the camera normally handheld. You can take your infrared shots handheld. And for a person like myself who's interested in the relationship between light and... Um, things on the ground, some of those relationships only last for a few seconds. And so you don't have time to put your camera on a tripod, compose, put the filter on and take the shot. You've actually just got to take the shot. And some of the photographs um, that I'll be showing tonight uh, are examples um, of that. So no, I was never inclined to, uh, to go back to the old way and, and just put a filter on the, on the front of the lens. I mean, I, I do that for normal photography, taking long exposures of waterfalls and such such like that. I'd, I'd rather have something like the uh, the 5D Mark II where I just pick up and shoot, take the shot, basically. <clears throat> no, that's exactly right. And, and it, it gives you the, um, yeah, so much more flexibility. Yeah, the, I guess, yeah, the big difference is if you screw a filter on the front of the uh, lens, um, you already have the hot... Um, 
you'd have that hot mirror filter that I mentioned, or it's still on there. So you're actually blocking infrared light, but then you're trying to block the visible light. And so <laughs> you, you've got a huge amount of very, well, very, very little light actually coming through then uh, yeah. because of that. And so that's why you're having to do very long exposures, um, uh, you know, use, with a screw on uh, right. filter. So it, it's definitely an option if you're wanting to play. I mean, it's a big difference between paying in you know, $100 for a filter versus, you know, $500 for a conversion or something like that. But it probably is better to take that money and just invest in the conversion, to be honest, because um, the results you'll get um, with a conversion is, is, is in orders of magnitude better um, from that respect. So you know, lot, lots of issues with movement, um, any, any sort of moving, moving subjects out by the sound of it with a the screw based option. Yeah, that's right. That you know exactly. You're not able to handhold, and um, like that shot that you were referring to, Paul, that won the competition was actually a handheld image, and so you know it would have been impossible to take that photograph with a um, with a you know a, a, a filter over the front of the lens. So um, that's quite important. I guess another thing to note is between the 720 and 830 nanometer conversion. Um, if you go with the 720, it is a lot more handholdable because it's letting in a bit more visible light. So you, with the 830, um, you have to really push. Um, or 820 have to really push the ISO a little bit higher. That's why you can see the picture um, of me is a little bit grainy at the moment too, because it's really kind of having to, you know, push for a bit of extra light. So there is a bit of a difference there. Um, so that's just something to note. I think for, for most folks, um, you'd be happy with either conversion. Um, I would probably um, push towards more the 720 conversion, just mainly because um, you've got a bit of extra hand holdability um, and you could probably uh, increase the contrast of a 720 image and, and emulate an 830, um, not too difficult um, to do that. And also on top of that, you, if you wanted to, you could play with false color as well. Um, I'll try and bring up some examples just to show what uh, false color looks like. Um, there's some pretty good um, examples on the, on the web of um, um, those sort of things. So I'll just um, share my screen now and... Um, just have a quick look at a, a few things here on, on Google Images. Um, here we've got, um, you know, I think this is super color, but the, the idea is that you can still bring back a blue sky, but then your foregrounds are, you know, looking very, um, uh, you know, look, look very different. So um, it's another sort of classic look of a, a, a false color image. Um, very ethereal, very otherworldly. Personally, I, I don't um, particularly uh, enjoy it too much um, because it is so unusual and different, but um, that's me thinking as a, a landscape photographer that enjoys selling images for tourism and things like that. I don't think um, uh, tourism would, would get too excited about these kind of images, unfortunately. Um, so, but they are, um, you know, very interesting. And, and what, one thing that's really great about um, infrared is the... Um, the, the, the greens just go this beautiful uh, white color, the foliage, and the, I think it's the chlorophyll. So if you can get a situation like this, where you have a dark trunk and then the beautiful green foliage, um, and then, you know, it's all about clouds too, getting these beautiful fluffy high clouds as well. Um, you can get some, you know, quite a bit of impact out of the images. So I you know Peter's got some excellent examples of that. I'll just bring up this um, just to, that's uh, probably not the best one. Um, we can see here, this is the, the wavelength of the visible light spectrum. And um, uh, and basically, I don't know what I did there, um, you know, infrared sitting right at the end here. So that's why it's sort of out of that visible spectrum. Um, I don't know if there's a, no, that's probably, <laughs> I should have had one prepared, ready to go. But that sort of gives you an idea or any way of, of where that sits in the spectrum. So yeah, I'll, I'll um, stop sharing there, but. Uh, hopefully that was useful just to, to go over all of that. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I've just checked if there's any questions, but feel free to ask any questions if you do um, around the technical aspects. Um, there is quite a um, bit of a technical um, hurdle there. Um, someone um, mentioned on the chat that they've gone for a spool. Uh, Robin went for a full spectrum conversion in Melbourne. Um, she must have been um, camera clinic in Melbourne and she had a good experience. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. And then, and then she's been using filters on top of a full spectrum conversion. So, um, so that, that's, that's definitely an option, um, to, to do that it gives you a bit of functionality and, 
Um, often full spectrum is used for astrophotography and things like that as well. So it also enables you to, to photograph quite a few other things as well and gives you a bit of flexibility. So from my perspective, and I'm sure Peter's perspective, um, having a, a baked in infrared conversion is probably um, really good if that's all you're trying to do. It keeps things very simple. You just pick up the camera and use it like a normal camera, um, but you're shooting in this most amazing, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess... Um, ethereal kind of landscape you're seeing the thing i love about infrared is you're literally seeing the world in a different light and um and that's that's why it just looks so different so yeah did you have anything to add to my um ramblings there peter <laughs> uh, uh, just a few points um the uh, i'll just talk about the cost if 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 people are thinking about it yeah uh, and to give you an example, comparative cost between, say, LifePixel and Camera Clinic. Clinic. LifePixel are based in California, so you've actually got to post your camera body over to them. Take it, if you do, take, make sure you take the camera battery out of the body and pack it separately. But for Canon DSLRs, they will charge um, from $275 US for the consumer um, models up to $350 for the high-end Canon full-frame models and this is that's us dollars and and for the same cameras uh camera clinic will charge australian dollars between 495 and 595 and that's 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 an idea of the, the cost um <clears throat> both of those um converters will talk to you about the need to do focus calibration um and this is because after they um they put the take out the hot mirror filter and put in the IR filter. They need to calibrate a lens for the camera because the IR spectrum, uh, the IR does not focus on the same focal point as visible light. Um, so that's why you need to um, have a lens to calibrate. Um, uh, LifePixel has default lenses they use for particular types of uh, cameras. For Canons, they will use a 50 millimeter lens um, to calibrate. Um, yeah, I'm saying, sorry to interrupt, Peter, that um, with um, like mirrorless cameras, I don't think you need to calibrate them because it's based off the sensor rather than uh, in, in some other respect. That was, that was going to be my very next point. You're, <laughs> you're right. Um, LifePixel describes mirrorless uh, cameras as the holy grail of infrared photography for that very per, uh, reason it it auto they will auto focus infrared light so there's no need for any um, calibration and they suggest that if if you're thinking about actually buying a camera to get converted they say buy a mirrorless camera um, and get it converted i don't have um if you don't get the folk, uh, the calibration done, then you may experience um, some front and back focus shift, uh, depending on your composition. But I use only manual lenses, um, so I have to focus myself any time, anyway, all the time. So it's not an issue for me. Um, I think those were the only, yeah, the only thing that I wanted to um, to cover in terms of the technical aspects that you hadn't already talked about. Mm. Oh, thanks, Peter. Yeah. Robert, I was talking about using lenses on top of converted cameras. Is, is that kind of I mean it has a similar the similar way that you use filters on a normal camera, or is it a totally different process, or totally different kinds of filters? Or I wasn't quite sure what she was referring to. Uh, well, they will still be opaque, so you still need to use a tripod. Oh, I mean, like, I mean, I think I've got the sense you're talking about using filters like on a converted camera. So, is that, uh, is there other kind of filters you use additionally? You know, um, it's a bit, you might be referring to full spectrum conversion and then using a filter over over the top of that, perhaps. I'm, I'm uh, not sure. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. um, if, you, if you convert it, so you're basically taking that hot mirror filter out and you're not putting anything else back in there, then the camera is going to take in everything, including the um non-visible spectrum and and put that in the picture and but then you can actually put a filter over the front of the lens or, or some some you can actually also get little filters that actually clip over the sensor as well which is also another very handy way of doing yeah. it um and then you can actually choose which filter to apply so a lot of folks 
these days probably say that's the ultimate way of going because then you have complete flexibility in terms of how you choose to um, use that camera. I think we had a comment on YouTube from, I think it was Praveen, just saying that he's done something similar to that and it enables him to capture um, hydrogen alpha, um, sort of the deep red colours in, in astrophotography as well. So, um, so you know, it's the, the, you can actually get a lot more out of it than just um, shooting in infrared. I think Troy Caswell as well, who's um, an absolutely fantastic astrophotographer, also shoots a very little bit of infrared um, and, and he also does a lot of astrophotography um, for that reason as well so yes um that's um all good i think we've also had a question on youtube just about if is uh, bw vision plugin used in ps i'm not sure what that um if you can um clarify that alfonso we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you on that um cool um all right well um i think um peter's actually prepared a presentation for us um, um so very very much looking forward to that and um it's probably a really good time um just to launch into that peter if if you okay. um yep. would like to um go ahead with that that'd be brilliant okay i shall do So this bridge may be recognisable. Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. Um, this was taken um, with uh, my infrared 5D2. Um, this is just an introductory picture, basically. Um, and the 24 millimeter tilt shift lens. Um, and I've got a graphic um, of, of that lens and I can also talk about how I was able to do this particular photo. In fact, I'll do that now. So a tilt shift lens, um, if you use the shift function, you can move the, uh, you move the lens uh, relative to the camera sensor from left to right or up and down, depending on how you rotate um, the lens. So the camera stays in the same position and you basically make a panoramic by shifting the lens across. Um, so for a 24 millimeter on a full frame, this gives an effective focal length of 14 millimeters, but it's not distorted. Um, which is pretty good, um, providing you pointing the camera um, directly ahead. Just a, a question on, on the use of tilt shifts. Is there, um, I, I mean, I absolutely adore tilt shifts as well. Um, I'm sure that you probably influenced me there as well. Uh, but, um, the, you know, was there a particular reason you chose them from a performance and infrared perspective or was it just kind of like you merging two kind of really um, big interests in terms of having, you know, infrared and then you really love tilt shifts and it just sort of happened to work for you? Um, I initially um, got into using tilt shifts um, because of my normal black and white photography, landscape photography, and I just found that they also work, worked well with the infrared. Mm. Um, so that's why I say it's, uh, I, I, I can go on shoots and just take the two camera bodies and the same lenses um, and use them on both, both cameras. Beautiful. So... Um, these are my cameras and most of my lenses, the, the, one, the lenses I use most of the time for infrared, the 10D I sold. I, for both cameras, I, I use the same deep black and white infrared filter at 830nm. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. I'm not, I'm not interested in colour uh, infrared photography because it's, for, for my eye, it's a bit like selective colouring. You, you, it's fun to do for about five days and then after that, it's not, and it doesn't take you anywhere. And um, I wanted to get the, the deep black and white infrared filter because the human eye can only see up to about 720 nanometers, and this is 830. So I'm pulling out massive amounts of detail and contrast that um, I'm, a lot of the time I'm just not seeing. Um, and you'll see that in some of the examples, um, particularly uh, the the shots of clouds that I've got in this presentation, the difference that that makes. Um, and as well, I'm not really, another reason is, is I'm not really interested in that snowy, hazy um, effect of infrared uh, photography. Um, I try to make my infrared photos look as close as possible to um, a black, uh, black and white, a normal black and white photograph. And it's always great for me when I exhibit my photos and they're all black and white, but um, 
I like it when people come to see the exhibition and some of the photos they can't make up their mind if they're if they're looking at a black and white or infrared. This is the 24 millimeter tilt shift. You can see the tilt function here at the front, and this is the shift function here at, here at the back. Whoever uh, took this photo extended um, both the tilt and the shift to its maximum. Um, I wouldn't um, advise doing that um, because you get um, shading on in the corners. Um, the beauty of the Mark II 24 millimeter is you can actually rotate um, and use the tilt function independent of the um, shift. Under the Mark I version, if you're tilting horizontally, you're shifting vertically and vice versa. But the Mark II, you can actually move this tilt function, or ro or rotate it um, and use it independently. Um, interestingly, the 45 millimeter and the 90 millimeter, fantastic lenses. They were uh, initially designed for Canon's film, film cameras and back in the 80s, um, and they're still um, available today. Um, they're great. They've lenses. updated them too, haven't they, Peter, in terms of the, there's newer versions? There are, there are newer versions, but, um, I, I mean, I don't ha have an issue with either of these lenses in terms of using them. Um, it's quite possible uh, the new ones might have hotspots too. You never know. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. You never know. And I also use on occasion... Um, the Zeiss Distagon 21 millimeter. Uh, that is just an awesome um, lens um, to use. And all these lenses are, uh, as I said before, manual focus lenses. So I, I don't have a problem worrying about um, focus calibration. So to start with, I've just got a, a few photos um, that I'm quite proud of from uh, my days when I started shooting the, with the uh, 10D, the converted camera. Um, after a while, I realized that the 10D doesn't, isn't really ideal for um, an 830 NM because the 10 d has only got six megapixels <laughs> capacity <laughs> uh, compared to 21 for the 5D2. And if you if you've got a deep black and white infrared filter on there that, that's drawing a lot of detail out of what you're shooting, then um, the 10 D is just not up to the, to the task. <clears throat> this is an early shot I took at um, Piermont. Um, and at the time I was still using the 24 to 70, uh, which I don't use anymore for um, infrared um, photography, but it's just um, looking straight up um, into the sky. <clears throat> this uh, particular photograph um, is basically as I looked at it in the viewfinder after taking the shot. It's um, a photograph of one half of the Commonwealth Bridge at, um, in Canberra. And most people shoot that bridge in the, or in the middle of the two bridges. So you've got converging lines going off into the, into the distance. Um, this, these two lines um, interested uh, me because of the shadow here. So this is um, shadow and this is also shadow, but this is sky. So in the right lighting um, conditions, an 830 nm uh, black and white filter will render the sky black, basically. Um, and I have found that particularly useful for um, doing, for example, still lifes of um, plants and trees in the Royal Botanic Garden. If I can isolate that tree and have the sky as the back, route, back, back um, drop, it will be black and then everything else will just be um, what you're shooting. Um, a little bit of a Moira effect um, there and a little pixelation on some of the details. Um, but overall, this shot was good enough to exhibit um, in 2014. Beautiful shot, Peter. Thank you. I just love it how the, you know, the, those deep blue skies just get rendered black and it, you know, it yeah. so much um, you know, option, especially if you have one of those white fluffy clouds or something like that up there. Um, yeah. The cloud just, just hanging pops there. like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. 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 But this, this particular day was in the middle of winter in Canberra that was about zero degrees um, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky and it was about seven o'clock in the morning. 
Um, no, it couldn't have been seven o'clock. It was, it was very early, early in the morning. Um, I used to, for a time, work in Piemont, and um, at lunchtime I'd, I'd go for a walk in um, Piemont and uh, Sydney with the, with the camera. Um, I, I don't normally take uh, infrared shots in the middle of the day. The, the light has to be, has to be right. Um, if it's hazy or overcast, um, I just I won't even attempt it. Um, the thing I like about uh, this particular shot is the, the tree is in the city landscape um, and I've got direct light there. I've also got some indirect light and some reflected light. And I've actually got a, a group of photos that um, I've shot in cityscapes and I'll explain why um, it's great to photograph those in black and white and um, uh, particularly in, in infrared. Um, but this was an early example of, of what I've been able to achieve. And on this particular day, I just waited for this particular gentleman just to come in to walk into the light and um, then I took the shot. So now we get into Iceland, and I do remember you going to Iceland, Luke. <clears throat> I remember and having a chat to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd been wanting to go to Iceland with my uh, infrared camera for, um, for a few years. I was supposed to go in 2013, but I got married instead, and um, all the, um, the wedding present money was supposed to go to the trip, but um, we bought a house instead. Um, <clears throat> probably a good investment <laughs> yeah which I'm sitting in now so I got delayed you went you got there first and you got the money shot uh, which was quite a stunning shot and uh, I will admit to being uh, jealous of you being there and shooting infrared so I put together a little collection um, because I've only ever seen that one shot of yours from um, Iceland I, I I know you've taken more than one. I took um, um I've actually took a whole series of um churches in infrared, probably about 20 different Icelandic churches, and I've just been sitting on that for years. And um, <laughs> there's actually um, I shot more in infrared my first trip than I shot colour. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's almost a crime that I'm still sitting on that stuff to be right. honest. But um yeah, I've got plenty to Come plenty on, of the dust games. logs there. Talk to Dex. Dex was on the trip with me, and yeah, he's still um, ropeable that I haven't released that series yet. <laughs> well, uh, I, we spent uh, three weeks in 2016, and another three weeks 2018. We drove all up over 10,000 kilometres, and oh wow, I'm still I'm still processing some of those photos. The the main aim was to um, shoot waterfalls, so, so I've shot about 50 odd waterfalls in Iceland but also to do some IR and the whole trip in 2018 was black and white. The first couple of all these photos from here on in have been shot with 5D2 and I highlight which lens I used and I also show the settings. And I, I noticed your comment about um, the 830 NM not letting in any um, normal light and so you have to pump up the ISO to be honest I, I haven't had to pump up the ISO that much on the 5D2 in fact some of my IR shots are shot at ISO 50 and okay. a lot of the 100 uh, I think uh, if, if a shot that I would take with my normal camera was ISO 100 uh, with the IR it would be about 160 um, or 200 um, not too much Another thing I want to mention is the, the first six shots or so uh, I took with the 90 millimeter. Um, shooting in Iceland and, and for me personally was um, a real challenge because I wasn't used to such vast landscapes that they have. Um, so I had to, uh, apart from getting up close to some waterfalls, which I was used to, but for shots like this, um, I had to re rethink um, my strategy on, on on taking photos, and that's why a lot I used to, the ninety millimeter um, quite a lot. Um, the five D two um, really loves the IR five D two really loves um, late afternoon as well as um, early morning. 
And it's just a case of finding where is the sun shining and then composing from, from then on in. Um, again, a 90 millimeter one. And this is getting really late in the day. And I, I found well, I can still take in good infrared shots with detail and without any um, grain uh, or noise um, after sunset, um, just for uh, when that light is still um, lingering. Um, but again, it's a case of seeing the light and um, stopping and, um, and composing the shot. I know <laughs> you would have found this uh, in Iceland. You'd be driving along the, the highway and you'll see something and you, you need to stop and shoot it, but you can't because there's nowhere to pull over. <laughs> and so if you do veer off, you go into a ditch, basically. And that, well, you pull up was... and then you have to walk, you know, a few hundred metres back to try yeah, and then exactly. you realise you were higher up in the car. and then. Yeah, yep. yep. Yeah. And... Uh, we were on a four-wheel drive, so we did a lot of driving on dirt roads, and you're not allowed to drive off-road. So um, a lot of shots that I take uh, were literally taken by the side of the, um, the road or the four-wheel drive. This um, shot um, I took um, in southeast Iceland, and I took it just off Highway 1. Uh, unfortunately, there was somewhere for me to pull over. And this is what I mean by the the vastness of the landscape and uh, having to rethink uh, how I take landscape photos. But you see these little dots over here? Um, they're actually headlights of yeah. super jeeps. Um, so I, I like pointing those out just to give people an idea of the scale that you're working with mm. uh, and the environment. Uh. And I hope that I'm getting across more of a black and white feel to these photos than an in, than your warm and fuzzy uh, infrared feel. Um. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll be very yeah. curious to see a, a black and white uh, so, sort of side by side to an infrared to, to get a sense of just how different the light transposes yeah. Yeah. between the two. Because it's I I just see that as a black and white the way you're presenting it. You know, just because it has that has that aesthetic so beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I exhibited the infrared shots, I had, did have some old timers look at them and they thought that um, they had been taken, they were black and white photos taken on a film camera um, mm -hmm. and they couldn't quite pin it down. This was um, a mountain called Einhörninga uh, in, um, in Iceland. It's, um, you take a, the mountain road F261 and go into the centre of um, of uh, Iceland to, to cir circumnavigate a particularly large uh, glacier. Um, so we're on dirt road. We're not allowed to drive off the dirt road. The sun was struggling to get through the clouds, but every time it did and, and hit this mountaintop, I just stopped the, the land cruiser and, um, and got out and, and took the shot, still with a 90 millimeter. This one I got, managed to get the farmhouse in so again it gives you an idea of scale and I didn't know it at the time but the road actually wound its way around here and around the back of this particular mountain same mountain and um, the the weird shape of it was um, starting to become um, quite obvious and still using the 90 millimeter did you ever um, see Andy Lee's um, series from from Iceland at all, Peter? No. Uh, it's one something um, folks were worth looking into as well. He did um, a sort of absolutely brilliant series of um, infrared images from Iceland as well, and um, it's definitely a bit of a, a delight for um, photographers to, to to photograph in that that way over there. Yeah. Was that black and white or color? Um, he did a little bit of, uh, he'd had a really beautiful blue series, actually. He, he sort of colour toned a lot of it in a, in a bluer sort of colour. Uh, yeah. And then he did a bit of black and white stuff too, but it was all mostly from a IR converted camera just to get that, you know, the real strong contrast and had a lot of roads leading down into the light in the distance and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, right. definitely worth looking up. Very, very old series now, but um, uh, I remember him hearing um, Ricardo saying that um, Andy's quite a big inspiration of his uh, from back in the day, so. Cool. I think he's a bit inactive now, but yeah. mm. this is the, the same mountain. We're getting closer to it, and it's also the top of its changing shape. And 
Um, the re reason why I like this particular um, photograph is it's tack sharp, but also um, the different tones and the contrasts are, are really coming out with the, um, with the IR. And now we're going um, north of um, the mountain and it's got this huge cavity uh, on this particular side. It's, it's quite an extraordinary sight um, to see. The weather on that particular day was just perfect. And there was a lot of nice uh, cloud, but it was moving fast and there was a lot of sunlight as well. And this is on the way back. On the, we had to stop and turn around. We, we couldn't do the circumnavigation. We, we crossed about five rivers, and I think the sixth one was just a little bit too high. And uh, uh, my wife, Tanya, was the one that had to get out of the Jeep every time and, and see how deep the, the river was. And, and the sixth one was above her thighs so that we, we didn't risk it being a rental. Um, <clears throat> So I thought infrared will be good um, in shooting snow, but it's not, to be honest. Um, uh, normal black and white cameras, I think, is better, um, produces better results in shooting snow. And also um, black and white, uh, sorry, infrared, when you're shooting water, can produce quite dark results. And uh, I think I've got an example of that. Um, this was just uh, us exploring. We we're actually looking for the um, the secret canyon um, in Iceland that um, everyone wants to shoot, but a lot of people don't know where it is because locals. I know the don't, one you mean, yes. It's... Yes, locals don't like talking about it, yeah. and um, we we had a tip off. We we ended up finding it, but on this particular day, we were looking for it and we didn't, and we came to the end of the dirt road. Um, we couldn't go any further because right in front of us, when you can't see it in the photo, um, the bridge had been washed out by a flood. Um, and I used the infrared camera on this occasion because of the light. There was a soft light coming through on the top of this glacier just there. Um, so that was um, how I composed the, the shot to get that um, as being the subject. But also the detail that, you, that uh, the infrared allows you to draw out of something so complex mm. as this landscape. Um, and yet there's, it's three different types of um, detail. You've got all these tiny little pebbles and stones and almost sand at the bottom. Then you've got these ragged um, um, bits of um, ice and then you've got the mountain um, side behind it. And, you know, I just felt that the the, the IR camera shooting at 830 nms, I was able to get a way more detail out of this. Um, and note it's only it's only F8, so it's not uh, it's not stopped down uh, a hell of a lot. <clears throat> Peter, how would that present tonally to the eye? Like that's very, very even tonality all the way through front to back. But if you're standing there looking at it, is it present that way or i'm still trying to wrap my head around you know the way light translates in infrared yeah this is um it's not a this particular composition is is not a big color palette uh we're talking brown and black down here and very dirty um glacial ice uh, as it's moving down it collects dirt um, a, a, about the only colourful aspect in this frame would have been a bit of blue sky behind these clouds, um, but and, and that was that was it basically. But I, I mean, I I was presented, and I always am when I go to these places and places like Italy and Norway. You are presented with a very strong colour palette, but I choose to shoot uh, in black and white um, for various reasons. And in particular, if the light is right for IR, I will go for the IR. This is one of the examples too that I really enjoy. Like you can 
uh, have a sort of a spotlight effect with IR where, you know, you can see the hills in the background are in, in the light and the foreground probably isn't. And, the, you know, the contrast you get um, in, is just so much more heightened in infrared, isn't it, Peter? It, it absolutely is. And um, visually looking at this scene, um, obviously you've got the snow, the white snow on the mountains, but here, these, these are the icebergs that are broken off the glacier and they're, they're actually floating in the, the lake at Jokusal and waiting for the high tide to take them out. Um, so there are a range of blues, um, light to dark, and then you've got dirt wrapped up in these um, icebergs as well. And, and colour, it's, um, it's a messy palette. And all I wanted to do was to capture the different contrast and tones. The, the, this particular photo I like um, because of the tonal variations um, that the infrared camera has been able to, uh, to give me more so than shooting uh, normally. Um, shooting normally, I would have had to compensate um, for the light up here. Whereas um, for infrared, I just haven't had to do that at all. Uh, you just point and, um, and away you go, focus and away you go. Mm. Okay, so now we've changed uh, lenses. So we're now on the um, 45 millimeter um, lens. Still quite... Um, um, a massive uh, landscape to, to take into account with that uh, with that particular lens. So this is in um, South Iceland. It's just by the the main road, and it was just this the light hitting hitting just here was the one was what got me out of the um, four wheel drive to take the shot. Is it one of those cases where you kind of could see the spot moving along, and you just sort of yeah. sat there waiting? And yeah, no. I could see the spot on the mountain. <laughs> yeah, that quick. Yeah, I had to stop and take the photo. Yeah. Um, this one, however, I could I could see the light was moving. Um, so we're on uh, Mountain Road F thirty five, which is way north of um, Golfos. Um, and this was literally um, being a dirt road. We could just stop, and there was no one else on the road, and I. I opened the door and just stood on the, um, the guardrail of the Land Cruiser um, and took the shot. And, you know, a minute or two later, and I, I, I would have been too late to take, to take the photo. Um, this particular photo won um, Landscape Photo of the Year. Um, Peter Eastway's um, Better Photography magazine. Oh, cool. okay. So... It, it beat every single colour photo that was submitted um, for the landscape prize. Um, so I was particularly pleased that um, I, I managed to win something too out of Iceland um, uh, as well as you. We are no stranger with um, doing well in competitions, Peter, so um, certainly um, very envious of your record at the uh, Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year in the monochrome category. Done very well there. So um, no, it's um, always lovely to see your work pop up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been a bit quiet there lately. Anyway, that was a great draw, um, day, that one. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah. So we're still taking uh, the shots here with a 45 millimeter and we're across a fjord in, in uh, West Fjord, not far from, um, oh, I forgot the name of the town starting with I, is a fjord or where we, we made, uh, we stayed for a few days. Um, I mean, what, what's, what season are you there? Oh, uh, right. Well, in, 2016, we went in late September, early October. And 2018, when, when this shot was taken, uh, we were there late October, early November, and winter had already arrived. Um, a lot of the mountain roads that we had been able to go on the previous trip had, were already closed. Um, we still haven't been able to, to walk Fagrafoss um, Gorge, which we're dying to do one day. Um, so at this particular spot, there had been um, uh, a blizzard, snow blizzard, uh, two days beforehand. Um, 
And uh, we were actually stuck in Isafjorda for a couple of days, but fortunately we had accommodation. We were planning to stay there anyway, but uh, um, yeah, that was unseasonal uh, winter, early winter. I'd love to go to Iceland in full winter. That's yeah, it'd sure. be amazing. Wouldn't have much light to work with though in terms of no. the day lengths, but no. Uh, my, my friend Jared Costain's done it and he said, yeah, you don't get much light, but the light that's there is just unbelievable the whole day. So I can, I can pretty well good imagine for that. Too, so. mm. I can imagine that. And there's sunsets. When we were there in autumn, there's sunsets go for hours. Mm. Um, it's great. Um, this was uh, taken by the 24 millimeter. So I did actually use the wide angle lens uh, on the infrared. It's the first rainbow I've photographed um, yeah. in infrared. Um, and I, I wasn't sure if it would turn out um, because obviously it's, it, you see the color and it's, um, uh, it's not only one rainbow, but it's two and potentially three rainbows. So this particular comp, uh, composition was color rich. Mm. Um, this is, this moss covering this, these rocks is dark green and sometimes emerald green color. Um, the only dark thing was this particular gravel um, road. Um, but, you know, I went for it in infrared and, and um, it's obvious that it's a rainbow, but it, it's not too weird from, from my point of view. It, it's still, to me, it looks like a black and white landscape photo. I just happened to have a rainbow in it. It's a bit like a fog bow as well. Um, yeah. 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 I guess it's proof that it's um, a full spectrum in a rainbow. You can still photograph some of the other light that's there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're back home and looking at trees. Um, IR just loves uh, trees. I'm sure it does, yeah. Now, I chose um, this shot for two reasons. Um, first is uh, one of the benefits of having um, a converted camera to shoot infrared. Most times I will take both my IR camera and my normal camera with me on shoots because I, sometimes I can, you know, look at the look at the light in the sky and, and make decisions to take one instead of the other. And half the time when I do that, I end up being wrong. So if I can tolerate ca carrying both bodies, I will take them. Now, on this occasion, um, we were staying at Crescent Head. I used to spend every Christmas when I was a kid at Crescent Head, my grandma had a house backing onto Killick Creek behind the, behind the beach. Um, so Crescent Head's not that new to me, but photographing it um, did become new. There's that rock um, below the golf course, um, just offshore at Crescent Head. It looks like a, a ship or a, mm. a, it's on a lean and people love to go down there at low tide and take a shot of the rock from inside the cave that, that's there. That's at The roof is the same shape as the outline of the rock. It's... It's a classic spot. So we were, we were staying in Crescent Head. We, we walked down the, there to take um, seascape shots um, at dawn. Sun comes up, not a cloud in the sky. And normally if you're doing seascapes, that's the end of your shoot. Um, there's no clouds, sun's up, end of shoot. So we packed up, climbed back up the cliff, saw this tree, the light was just gorgeous. So I just pulled out the infrared camera and started shooting and mm -hmm. taking photos. Um, uh, so on the same shoot, um, I managed to use um, um, both cameras. The other reason why I'm gonna point this out is I'm, I've shot this in the portrait position, but I've tilted um, the lens to create a field of focus in the center. So if you look at it carefully, you can see the focus drop off on the left and on the right. And that's both foreground and background. Whereas tilting the lens to allowed me to get perfect focus in the foreground and the background 
up here, it just happens to be in that in that middle band because I wanted to get the tree um, in focus uh, and everything else slightly out of focus. The reason I do that, it, it brings the subject that I've focused on, it brings it closer to the viewer um, and can give depth um, to, to an image. Um, I don't know if you remember, but one of those images that, that won uh, with the um, Australian Geographic was a, a photo of a rock that I took in front of a waterfall. Yes. I used, I used the same technique. Um, I did a yes. horizontal tilt. Yes. So the rock and is in perfect focus, but the waterfall just behind it is slightly out of focus. So that brought, brings the rock forward mm. um, to the viewer. Yeah, I adore that shot. It's, uh, yeah, magnificent, that one. Yeah. It's probably, you, you did mention something there um, while you're talking in terms of the time of day. It is it is one great thing that I've always appreciated with infrared is that, you know, your, your traditional, you know, visible light uh, shooting uh, conditions um, can give way and then um, then it's infrared time and often you do need the direct light on the landscape illuminating it and bringing out all of that contrast uh, for infrared to really do well. Yep, yep. Um, the... I, th I think there are, if, if the light, if the weather's okay, I, IR will still work very well in the middle of the day, um, mm -hmm. but it, it can't be a hazy, hazy day. This um, shot I took um, just down the road from where we live in Yosemite Creek, um, which flows into Minnehaha Falls, just going for an early morning uh, walk, no preconceived uh, ideas. Um, with infrared, I adopt this technique um, of backlighting uh, when there's trees. So I put the sun behind this particular tree um, and I knew that there was a bird's nest in just here, but I didn't realise there was another bird's nest over here until I processed the photo. Um, and I printed this um, almost a, a metre wide um, and exhibited it, um, and, and it has sold um, that large. And the reason I printed it large is because all this detail, this gorgeous fern detail has, has come out. I, I haven't, um, uh, I'm very um, strong on respecting the relationship between light and the shadow and it, and shade. It's one of the reasons why I turned away from colour photography because I was just seeing too many colour landscape photos that had completely wiped out all the, the, the greys and the blacks and the shades and the shadow, you know, to, to get some sort of perfect sort of uh, look. Whereas um, infrared will bring out that detail anyway. If this was a normal camera, this would be much darker. Um, in these areas here. Um, but because it's infrared, um, I'm able to get um, all this detail coming out. I don't have to process it that way. It's just, it's just happens that way. Mm. Um, this was another shot I took very near. This was another wander. This is in the middle of winter, uh, late afternoon now. So the sun um, is starting to make its exit from the ridge line um, beside me. Um, again, that nice crisp uh, winter light. And um, being IR, I can just point the camera straight up at the sky and, and not be worried about uh, blowing out the photo. Um, I can um, simply make sure that the, the light value is where it should be, which is um, right here on the tree and, and down down here, with the sky almost forming um, a backdrop that doesn't interfere or um, compete for the viewer's eye. Um, this particular photo um, I have also exhibited, and uh, I exhibited in limited edition, and, and it sold out. <clears throat> This is another tree shot, but now we're not looking um, 
up at the sky. We were actually looking at the ground. And I was walking from um, where you park your car at the end of um, Hat Hill Road in Blackheath and, and to get to the Anvil Rock Lookout. And this is just beside the track. And what caught my eye was the light on this rock and the base of this gum tree. Um, from a colour point of view, you, that your lens would not be attracted to this at all. Um, there's, there's, there's not that much of a colour palette, but from a black and white point of view, um, and given the light, the filtered light coming through and the detail that I wanted to get um, just on the ground, um, it was perfect for the IR camera. Absolutely perfect. And it's one thing you mentioned there too about um, you almost have to sort of see an IR to be able to pick uh, if the conditions are going to work for it or not. Uh, because it, like you mentioned, you might have just walked past that if it was a, you know, thinking of it as a colour scene, but, you know, you kind of need to see the potential there. Okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing this as a black and white photo that I'm going to use the infrared camera to, to take. So... The IR thing comes out by um, what's the light doing? Mm -hmm. Is the light um, crisp enough? Is it clear enough? Um, is it, it can't be too glary. Um, it, it has to be the right kind of light. And that's when I know I can use the infrared camera. Oh, interesting. This is me thinking about a black and white photograph. Mm. Um, but one that I know that I can get more detail out without having to play around with bracketing or filters, um, without blowing um, the highlights and still respecting these, uh, these shades and shadows. Yeah, um, I guess that's the big difference in being a primarily black and white photographer because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, it's either going to be colour or it's going to be infrared, but of course, um, you know, the, the black and white step probably comes first and then if you know infrared's going to even enhance the scene further then that's when you would go there so it's a much more of a, a sort of a staged approach I suppose there yes yes I mean I as a photographer I've given up taking color photos um, for a number of years now um, and photos like um, if, if I take a black and white photo with my normal camera I set it to monochrome I look at it black and white on the back of the camera I open it up in DPP, Canon's processing software, in monochrome. I will process it as a monochrome. I will print it and exhibit it and sell it as a monochrome. And there are photos that I've done that um, process. We've, we've never seen them in colour. Mm. Um, um, and I don't, But I don't have to worry about that with infrared, of course, because I set the camera to the monochrome and that's how it comes out mm. and so forth. So... For me personally, uh, these days, it's not a, not a question, will this be a colour photograph or a black and white? My question to myself is, do I pull out the infrared or do mm. I pull out the 1DS3 oh. um, to take a black and white? Yeah. And uh, I was living in um, Italy uh, for six months last year and including during lockdown in Tuscany. And the first day after 10 weeks of lockdown that we were allowed to go for a walk, I went for a six hour walk to the 12th century Capella uh, on, in a famous one on a farm. And on the way, there was a shot just begging, uh, begging for a camera and it was just rolling hills that had been um, ploughed. So it was just, there was just nothing except the sh shape of the hills. And it was, it was a question of, um, I started shooting with the infrared and because I thought it would work, for, and it didn't work for infrared. Put the infrared away, picked, pulled out the 1DS3 and shot it in um, black and white. Did take some infrared in Norway, but not as uh, much as I expected. Um, mainly just normal black and white, but on occasion um, the environment would induce me to, to pull out the, the IR. And this was one particular day we would, we were actually driving down this road in our rental this, and the, the fjord is over here and the sun's up over here. And 
um, I had been driving for five or ten minutes thinking this is actually looking good for an infrared um, photo and, and I just need to find the right trees. And when we drove past these trees, that's when I decided to, to pull over and, and turn the camera back towards um, these trees. The sun's over here, so it's not really an issue. Uh, and um, the composition just basically presented itself with these line, the line here and the lines going down here. Um, but once again, um, I, I process this to look like a back, black and white photograph, not to, um, to show um, white and fuzzy um, tree foliage. It's... Cool. Fantastic. So this, um, this is a, a village called Hopperstad in, um, in Norway. Um, they have what they call stave churches from the Middle Ages. They're, there's about a dozen of them still standing, uh, sprinkled around Iceland. So we specifically wanted to go to this town to shoot this particular stave church. Um, and to get there, we had to drive over a mountain pass, which was completely covered in snow. Um, and the snow beside the road was, um, you know, at least two metres high. Snow would come early. And then we get to the town, and it's, it's on the edge of the fjord and there's, there's no snow at all. This particular state of church, we were lucky we were able to um, walk around and get up really close to it, and um, other state of churches had already closed for the tourist season. Um, but, again, this, this, the sun is coming from my right. It's... Um, it's lighting the scene for me. I just had to shoot this tree mm. um, with the Stave Church. It was just a begging uh, to be shot. And the storm, approaching storm um, helped as well. <clears throat> it would have been a completely different look if, if you didn't have that storm behind and it was, you know, uh, that sort of adds to the drama and the mood, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but by the same token, I, um, you're right, it, it did contribute to... Uh, the drama and the, and the mood, but I'm looking at it now. If if there had been a blank, uh, sorry, a cloudless sky, you would be looking at um, a soft black background, mm -hmm. um, and in a way that that could have accent that might accentuate the drama going on um, just here. Yeah. Um, I have a big issue with Frank Hurley compositing wall photographs with um, dramatic clouds and sun rays to convey the true drama of war. And my view is just look at the, the dead soldiers on the ground. You don't need a dramatic sky to do that. Mm. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> uh, this is an example I wanted to give of um, what IR will do to trees, tree leaves. And in particular, leaves that are re, uh, trees that are regenerating after a fire. Um, so I've shot a lot of uh, recovering bush after fire. This one was at uh, Cahill's Lookout. Uh, the fire was in November 2014. It took out the house next to this one. And this was shot um, a year later, um, by which time the trees were well on their way to recovering. A lot of the Blue Mountains is looking like this right now mm -hmm. <laughs> after the, uh, the late 2019, early 2020 um, bushfires. Uh, again, in processing this, I've tried to avoid that, um, that hazy, wish-washy look um, in trees um, and leaves. I've tried to make sure that there's actually detail coming out in this particular photo, but bottom line, infrared, black and white, it loves um, uh, recovering um, bush, bushland. Peter, how much is it your exposure at the time as opposed to post-processing to keep the crispness of the whites with the infrared and keep the detail? Um, 
because you've obviously mastered that better than most from what I can see. And um, yeah, just quite curious. I, my, I, I'm, I belong to a couple of Facebook um, infrared groups and it's disappointing when I see um, photos uploaded to that group when they haven't processed them at all, either they haven't sharpened them or they haven't reduced the, the luminance values You've got you've got to um, apply a lot of the time a, a green filter, um, so I would have applied a green filter on in DPP bef before I'd done anything else, um, just to scale down that that brightness um, and bring it um, bring that initial black and white um, effect. Uh, I will also later on apply a selenium tone at ten percent just to remove a bit of the brown, a bit more of the brownness, bring it more to black and white. And apart from that, I, I, I'm very light on the mouse uh, in terms of contrast. I try to be very light on the mouse in terms of contrast. And does that mean that um, you don't actually kind of, you know, click the black and white button and actually send it to grayscale? You, a lot of the time there may be a slight amount of original sort of colour tone there. Um, that's true. Um, and in, I've, I, when I give talks on black and white photography and I get asked uh, sometimes, why, why do you say you shoot in black and white? You know, aren't you shooting in colour and then converting it later? And shouldn't you be using channels to, to do that? Um, whereas, and the first time that I got asked that, I, I, di I didn't have an answer for it. And, but the second time I got asked, I did. And my answer was this, for the same colour photograph, um, or sorry, for the same raw photograph that I've shot in monochrome, that I processed it all the way as monochrome, I then went back and converted it to landscape with the colours. And then in processing, converted it to black and white using channels. And I compared the two results and they were exactly the same. <laughs> so it, it, it made no difference. So that's just the way I work. Um, I mean, with infrared like this, it's easier. That's, this is what it basically looks like when you, um, when you take the shot and look at it on the back of your camera. It's pretty surreal when it comes out like something like that, Paul. Like it, you, Peter, Peter probably wouldn't have had to do too much, really, um, to because it's just um, not not saying anything about your ed editing there, Peter. But it's just you know it does really come out quite fantastical um, straight out of the camera like that. So. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, and it's, I found it interesting just talking on conversions to black and white. I, you know, with the 720 um, camera that I had, I often didn't enjoy the image as much. When I did a straight black and white, I preferred to tweak the colours and and um, maybe even have a very slight amount of the original, I guess, colour, or whatever, whatever that is, um, rather than just pressing the black and white button and then just um, letting that sort of wipe out all of those values. So um, certainly something where uh, one thing I really appreciated about is, you know, there's very different ways that you can actually choose to edit like uh, infrared images and um, probably much more so than any other sort of, um, I don't know, medium or different way of um, shooting that, I, that I've come across. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of curious if you if you did like obviously you know Peter's done a masterful job of, of creating um, a wonderful aesthetic that consistently flows through a lot of the images in terms of that total range and and, and the way he's managed what color was there, and I was just thinking that that must be quite a skill if you're if you're keeping that those color aspects in there and, and manually kind of working ways to, to drop that out because it must be quite different the way it comes through in different scenes to create a very consistent tonality through through a body of work um, as, opposed, as opposed to stripping it out for the start well if i if i have my infrared camera setting um on anything but monochrome it will come out as red and then i've got to uh, then i'll have to process it back from that red if you, if you know what i mean but i set it i have my camera set on monochrome you know, I'll shoot as a monochrome. When I open it in DPP, it will open it in monochrome. I can then change it to back to that red if I want to, but and then drain that red away. 
Um, and you know, I, I, I was experimenting at the start, and but you know, I'm, these days I'm, I'm just more focused on getting a black and white result. And I would do my best to get that result in the camera without having to play tricks um, in front of the uh, computer. Yeah. It's just particular, particular light such as this gorgeous light and, and what you're shooting um, can, um, you know, produce, make it easy for you in processing basically. And this is uh, another example of me um, using the sun um, backlighting, so shooting straight in the sun, but being infrared, I'm still able to, all this detail, this gorgeous detail in the sand and and um, and the foliage is, is still there. It's not being um, blown out. That'd be a really good test of a lens too, shooting right into the sun like that. It shows that that lens is a really, really... Um, dynamite lens for infrared, how it can handle that. Yep. Uh, the 24 millimeter Mark II, it, it, it does a really good job. I've um, used lenses that's... where you shoot into the sun and you get crazy flares that you just yeah. never would see invisible and, and all of yeah. that. So, yeah. Sensational. Wow. Um, so, we're back to the, the 45 millimeter also loves um, infrared and I chose uh, this in the next photo as uh, examples of black and white infrared photography just for this fog in the background. Um, I, I, I don't remember actually seeing that much detail there when I took the shot, um, but the infrared camera has picked up that detail. Um, so I've been able to retain the look and feel that this is an early morning early foggy morning but still get that um that that depth in the photograph and of course um, being able to focus on um, the subjects peter just had a question in the chat um what pro uh, program you use to process your black and white photos um, was it dpp mainly um no DPP is the, the Canon, the free software that comes with um, their cameras and you can, you can download it for free from the US um, website. That's just my initial. That's wh where I will look at all the photos and decide which ones to actually process. Right, and right. in DPP, I will do my red or green filter, sharpen it, and save and convert to a TIFF, leave the RAW, take the TIFF to Photoshop, uh, open up ColorFX and do some tonal contrast there and change luminous values if I have to. And then take it over to um, Silver, FX, Silver FX, apply the selenium um, tone if I have to, and final mid-tone and soft contrast adjustments. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, Lightroom, my wife tries to get me to use Lightroom, but I'm not a Lightroom fan. Um, Whatever works, really, at the end of the day. Whatever it's works. Certainly working for you. <laughs> yeah. So clouds in the landscape. I mentioned the 830NM um, filter can pick up more detail than, than we can see, and it can do this to great result. Um, Again, when the light is right and the clouds are right with, with clouds and the sky. Um, another 45 millimeter um, shot. Uh, this was a gorgeous morning. The sun was up over here on my, our right and there were rolling storms uh, coming through. So there's actually about two or three separate cloud banks in this, this particular photo. This was actually the, the lowest one, but it's nearer to us, and that's why it seems higher, whereas this was the high cloud, uh, cloud bank just here. Same lake, but um, different day and different time of day, um, shooting directly into the sun. Um, but because of the cloud cover, was able to avoid any... Um, uh, flare and 
I waited for the sun, for enough sunlight to give that uh, light on the on the lake as well. So for me, this this is this is my this would be a typical black and white photograph for me. And all I'm doing is photographing the light's relationship to the environment, and that that's it basically. Um, and that that's what I enjoy with um, black and white photography. Um, this was taken at Cahill's Lookout after that same fire that I mentioned uh, before, but this was um, closer. This is only a month, a few weeks after that fire. Um, the the clouds, the composition of the clouds matched the uh, uh, the land, so I got the shot. But it, the reason I like I love this photograph is the uh, the detail that, that I was able to draw out of the cloud without having to go to a full full on HDR effect. <laughs> All I'm doing here is is uh, sharpening the image and and maybe applying um, a bit of um, uh, soft contrast. So that's yeah. all I'm doing. I think with skies too, um, I can be really powerful because um, it does have a tendency to um, reduce a lot of the natural haze that's in the sky and, yeah. and bring out a lot more of the contrast and detail. I've, I've even have I've shot a scene where there's been bushfire smoke coming through the yeah. scene. And um, it's like the, or well, it just sort of miraculously disappeared in, yeah, the, in the infrared version. Yeah, yeah, it should straight through it. And that, yeah. that's why you're able to get um, detail of the landscape coming out of a foggy area that, yeah. I, that I showed before. Yeah. And this particular cloud formation, um, I, when I was looking at it with my eye, I wasn't seeing this <laughs> at all. <laughs> All I was seeing was a few wisps of cloud. Um, I wasn't seeing this detail until I took the photo with the infrared camera. Oh, this is a shot I took in uh, near Gaudix in um, southern Spain. Um, the sun's over here behind this tree. There's great cloud formation here. But what I think this is, is um, uh, this is a aeroplane jet stream and it's just been blown by the wind and it just happened to be um, blown in a different direction. Um, again, a, a photograph that you know, would have been harder to take and may not have worked as well with a normal black and white camera. Certainly those trees would have lost their impact um, with the less um, white foliage, yeah. Yeah. Cityscapes are black and white, Ioana oh, Nirvana. Now, the reason I say that is because of the environment of a cityscape um, when you've got built structures. Early in the morning, you've, you can have um, different light sources. So I've backlit lit this photograph. You've got direct sunlight coming down this terrace here. Um, you've got indirect sunlight here, but here, on the subject is reflected light. So the sun has hit the building that I'm leaning up against and bounced it back towards the subject. And again, using the IR camera, um, this is basically how, how it appeared in, in camera. Uh, I didn't have to do much processing it at all. Um, and I've still got this lovely detail coming out in the in the foreground because of that reflected light. Mm. Same, wow. same place, Siena, same great crisp early morning. Um, we that just parked trail. the Pleasant. car placing. Wow. and I noticed um, this gate and I went up to photograph the gate, but then I realised that there was casting shadows so I, I walk back and, and my back is against another high wall. So I've backlit the photo. I've got direct light on these trees. I've got indirect light happening and I've got reflected light um, happening over here. And, of course, this, <laughs> that was a bonus. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely superb, Peter. Mm -hmm. Again, the same morning, uh, the light was just pumping everywhere I turned that lens um, it was 
it was just yeah, begging to for a shot. So I'm cool that lit up that lantern there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. How it's lit up the lantern. I'm sure. No, no, no. This this was so early in the morning. This lantern is still on. Oh, it is. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, this one is still on, and this uh, these lanterns are still on. Oh, right. But the obviously the street's been lit by uh, the sun coming up. Mm. I'm standing in the shadows. I've I've already composed this photo, ready to go. When this person is way up up here. And I just waited for her to walk down the alleyway. She's focused on her mobile phone, doesn't even see me. Yeah. And I, I wanted to make sure she was underneath this light, but I still had some shadow. Yeah. So when she got to that point, I just took the shot. So that's, that's a demonstration of, um, of the advantage of having a converted digital camera as opposed to putting an infrared le- a filter on the end of your lens. This is a, definitely a, this is a handheld shot. This is just capturing the moment. Yeah. Uh, this was in my last exhibition um, at the Max Dupain Gallery in Lura, printed very large. I'm on top of a car park in Melbourne. It's late afternoon. I just went there on spec and I'm getting, uh, I just noticed this light bouncing off this skyscraper behind me and the light was moving across like this with the sun. I didn't have much time um, to take the shot. I only had time to compose to get this line going down here. So I've got direct light, I've got indirect light and I've got reflected light. And and that's why I say cityscape environments um, are nirvana for black and white infrared. Notice there too, you went with a 24105. So every now and then, um, I guess that's a much more adaptable lens to have in, you know, fast acting situations as well. Being yeah. able to, yeah, you mightn't have had your 45 mil on you as well. <laughs> Give um, you was it 47? At, at the time, I was commuting between Melbourne and Sydney. I was working yeah. in Melbourne um, three weeks out of four. So, and I'd come back to the Blue Mountains and do for some photography. So I was always switching where do I have my lenses and I had my wife's EF 24 105 with me at that on that particular occasion. Yeah. That's good to know that it still performs well. Yep. Um, I've only got uh, one or two for industrial landscapes. Um, I was actually visiting a professor at University of New South Wales in the law faculty in we were on the top floor and I was waiting for the lift and I just looked across the, the foyer and this is the, the top of the science building at the University of New South Wales. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few infrared shots that I've, I've shot on purpose because I went home and then next time I visited, I made sure I had my camera with me <laughs> specifically to get this specific um, shot. Um, and and you occasion- plan the visit around the weather just to get the right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was lucky. I mean, when you do that sort of thing, you've got to take the shot regardless. But I yes. was lucky because um, I'm, there's, there's, the sun is almost directly on this, but there's no cloud. So um, that left a clean palette um, yeah, exactly. to take that. And I was, I was actually looking for an abstract um, feel. Um, and this is the cement works at Oberon. Um, th- this was another occasion where I, I was waiting for the right conditions to actually shoot this particular photo. I, I took this from the road um, with the 90 millimeter and the sun's behind me. Um, but I just wanted to get all the different tones um, happening here on, on infrared, um, black and white. Knowing the sheen that, of the curved metal surfaces is beautiful. Yeah, unreal. And I had to be careful. I didn't. That I actually didn't blow the highlights on this, and that's why I'm shooting pretty fast at at, uh, mm. at one sixty to forty. But I knew that um, this black blackness would again um, act as a neutral background to what I wanted to be the subject of the of the photograph. Man, a detail in that smoke billowing out is pretty. Amazing too, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah. 
and all because of the uh, the eight thirty nm mm. uh, filter. Definitely. That's it. Brilliant. So I'll Fantastic. stop sharing this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for that, Peter, and um, uh, certainly um, rekindled some of the inspiration. Um, oh, I think my camera just went. Um, I'll let you just take over, Paul. My, the um, infrared camera doesn't have an AC adapter, so I need to change back. Oh, gotcha. Well, Peter, I, I'm not too far off racing out the door to, <laughs> to go for a conversion. It's just, uh, yeah. What an except the, the detail I found out just as I was, unfortunately I just on my phone, but in the last uh, third of the presentation, I realised I could actually zoom in with incredible detail somehow on what you're presenting, and, and it just opened up another world for me. The level of tonal detail that that you can just squeeze out of these files is unbelievable. And uh, yeah, having been shooting for twenty years and coming from film days, it's it's rare that I've seen that 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 the kind of depth uh, all the way through uh, in a total range. And, well, you can yeah, see why I, I, I love using it. Right away, to be honest. I, well, you can see why I love using that deep um, black and white IR filter um, for black, just for black and white photography. Yeah. Um, That's a separate but, filter that goes on top of your converted camera. Is that right? I'm sorry? It's a separate filter that goes on your, on top of your converted camera or just that the no, eight is the deep? That's the conversion. It's in the front. It's in the camera. It's in front of the sensor. Yeah, so, so yeah, I get so they, there's there's two different standard ones, Paul, that you can put on there. It's either the seven twenty or the eight thirty, um, and that's yeah, yeah, they, yeah. It was, it was it was more that the talk of additional ones on top of that. But so oh yeah, yeah. It's a, bit, it's a little, little bit confusing because you've got filters in front of the sensor, and then you've got filters in front of the lens, and sometimes you can also clip a filter onto the front of the sensor that's not permanently put there. So it is a, there is a different ways to filter the light um, depending on how you want to do it. So that, that, that can get confusing for sure. Well, I think the great, the great skill, which I haven't got on top of yet, even, even after this presentation, is how, how something presents to your eye and understanding how it translates, like how much colour is involved as opposed to just pure total density of light. You know, and, and that's that's a skill, for instance, for simple black and white conversion that takes years to understand and wrap your mind around uh, as you're walking around. Um, and you know, modern times, you can use the, that black and white con monochrome conversion on the back of your camera and a digital camera to, to help you adjust to that. But but I'm still sort of trying to think, oh, what's, what's the additional way and a mindset in terms of looking at a scene? And how much of it is is the color content, and how much of it is just the pure uh, light density that, that's going to translate? Because I guess certain colors translate quite um, differently in, in infrared and into the final sort of monochrome type look than traditional black and white photography. And I, I, I don't think I'm, that's going to take me a while to wrap my head around how that works. Oh, I just. Uh... It, it, it takes a little bit of a time. I will say that there are photos I take in the open landscape um, that I wouldn't take as a colour photograph um, because there's not, there's not enough colour contrast. There's other things going on there that provoke me to take um, a black and white photograph, either a normal one or with the infrared camera, and it's, and it's always going to be about the light and its relationship to what's happening on the ground. And it's always going to be that, not, not the colour aspects of, of, of any environment. And so, in fact, sometimes I will deliberately take an infrared black and white photo because it's a, it's a colour shot begging to, to happen. <laughs> I, I found, um, to add to that too, um, you can get situations where it's just absolutely terrible for infrared and you, you, you think it's going to look good, but you take the shot and because everything's so well lit um, or something like that, uh, everything, if you've got a huge amount of green foliage around, uh, it's just a sea of green, it can look really garish and, and quite um, um, hard to deal with. So when you've got some, like, you know, Peter's got his dark tree trunks and then he's got the, you know, the bright green foliage, you've got that natural contrast that allows for a bit of different tonalities. But, you know, if you, it's, I, I personally find it very, there's not as many scenes that work for infrared as maybe there might be that work for colour. I don't know if that's an accurate statement, Peter, to, for you, but um, the light for infrared, in my opinion, isn't, 
is is quite fleeting and and um, you do have to be prepared for it. I think. Yeah, you do, um, and I and. I would say that I'm, I'm actually fortunate to live in the Blue Mountains where the, the quality of the light is better than, say, if I was living in inner in city, mm. um, Sydney. Um, yeah, definitely, especially having all of those, um, you know, the, the, the cliff faces and all of the different foliage and vegetation. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And you can see why I love going to Iceland. Yes. Uh, I mean, the light there is just amazing, Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking um, not too much different with um, Tasmania. I mean, better should should get my, my um, body back out down here and, and um, have a bit more of a go. It's, it's definitely got a few cobwebs lately, um, but um, yeah, it's it's certainly a. It's also what thing with um, infrared and black and white in general is. It's just really great to, if if folks are normally shooting a lot of color to be able to then um, put their mind onto something else, and it's a nice sort of circuit breaker or you know taking it back to the basics as well. Uh, absolutely, and it's it's interesting when I do my black and white photography presentations to camera clubs, there will be infrared, black and white photos in the presentations and. So I briefly describe why that is and how they came to produce. And I have to say the majority of questions I get asked are about infrared photography. People are actually quite keen and interested to, to still learn more and um, how they could uh, do it with the camera they got sitting in the, the, the drawer that they no longer use. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, definitely a, a great way of repurposing old equipment. And I think, as I said earlier, a lot of the time yeah. you don't get much for it anyway. So you might yeah. as well um, you know, spend a bit of extra and convert it, and um, have a you know never know where it might take you. Yeah, I would say though, if you if you do, just, if someone does decide to get a deep black and white um, infrared filter, uh, and I'm talking eight thirty nm's and higher, you definitely need a digital camera that's got the pixel weight. You, you need at least the 5D to 21 megapixel um, um, to, do, to do it justice. Full frame would probably be better as well, I would have thought. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, full frame. Because yeah. you've got a bit more light collection potential and that kind of thing. And I think um, ideally you'd actually speak with whoever you're getting it converted with and they'd probably have a pretty good idea already how well that camera's going to do. So yep. yeah, it's sort of like well worth um, doing a little bit of research before jumping into it um, because um, yeah, you don't want to get a conversion and then and not really end up with the result that you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So, Peter, where, where to from here? You've obviously been, you know, working on some quite large bodies of work and, you know, and you've uh, you've you've um, you've challenged Lukey to to uh, see if you can come up with the caliber of Iceland work that you've just presented. That was, <laughs> that was that was just world class, Peter. As simple as that. Like that was absolutely astounding body of work. Do you do you have any particular long term projects that you're working on, or or some that are coming up, or or in, in the making at the moment? Um, no, I don't. Uh, people are asking me when I'm going to have my next exhibition. Um, and, and all I can say is that that will be when people can actually attend a gallery um, <laughs> and see it in person. Um, so that, that is down the pipeline and um, there will be photographs from my time in Italy um, where I lived for six months. That was a project that had nothing to do with photography. Um, I was actually writing a novel, uh, which has yeah. just been finished. So uh, my photography exciting to have that all, all um, squared away. Sorry, have your novel all squared away must be exciting to have that, that like um you know up, coming up in the future and that kind of thing. Um, it, it was yeah, it was um, it was two years of my life. But um, I've, I've finished the second draft. I'm very happy with it. It's and it's with some people at the moment. They're looking at it. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. fantastic. But. Uh, I mean, COVID has changed a lot of things. Um, uh, I mean, I've got bucket lists for photography that include places like Canada and Iceland and back to Italy and Spain and Portugal. But, uh, you know, we may be just be going to Tasmania or um, New Zealand, you know, have to take second best. And, mm. uh, I don't know about second best, Peter. <laughs> um, I think you'll find that's the top and um, everywhere else is just... Um, 
you know, something else to do. Um, another place you should add, I think, is the Faroe Islands. I, I, I really regret not taking an infrared camera there, but um, the dramatic sea cliffs and things there, I think, would be incredible in infrared as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to go to Faroe on the way to Iceland. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, magnificent. Yeah. Now, I had a question, um, a couple in the YouTube feed. Thanks for asking questions, everyone. Um, one's um, around um, editing. Um, are you familiar with um, BW Vision Pro as a Photoshop plugin? Um, apparently, some infrared shooters um, use, um, you know, uh, like using it or, or something like that. I believe that's the one that's developed by Joel Chinchilla um, uh -huh. uh, and, and um, really, really um, well-regarded um, um, Dutch uh, photographer, I believe. Um, is that something you've come across or um, use any sort of different plugins in Photoshop at all? Yeah, Joel's a sort of the guru of long exposure. I mean, really long exposure, yes. black and white photography. Uh, I hadn't heard of that um, BMW uh, app. Um, I'm I'm quite happy with um, the uh, the apps that I'm using at the moment. Um, but I will say there is a there is a, a Skylum software um, I have been using as well um, a bit lately. Um, but, uh, you know, once you get set in your ways, you get set in your ways, basically. Yeah. No. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, old yeah. Aussie, uh, Aussie analogy. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. And it's clearly working for you, so you don't really need to change much there. But um, it, it is, um, I guess there's always going to be new things that come along, and, and I always see those sort of things as, you know, have different tools in your tool belt and you yeah. work out well, which tools are the ones that work for you in the end. Well, to give you an example, um. I shoot a lot of my, and I showed them a few of the tonight. I shoot three, what I call three shot shifts, where I've got, I've got the camera um, in the um, portrait position. I'm composed in the middle. I turn the knob and the lens goes to the right, take the picture back in the middle, take the picture back over to the left, take the picture. Well, you've got to merge that. And um, the tilt shift lens doesn't produce any distortion if you put in. Well, Photoshop will merge those files for me without trying to correct distortion that's not there. Um, for other photos, it does try to correct the distortion, but for, for these photos, it doesn't. And so I like that. Mm. <laughs> I like to have the program just merge the photos. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. all I needed done. Yeah. Just put them together. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it works for me. So why would I, you know, be on the lookout for something, um, something else? No, it, it does work. Yeah. No, that's great. And um, what would you say to folks that kind of say, oh, you know, I can just make a photo look infrared in Photoshop so I don't really need an infrared camera? Do you think it's something that people could actually emulate in post-processing or is it just, you know, you can only ever... Um, shoot it and, and that's that's the you know what's the point in trying to do it after the fact we're talking chalk and cheese <laughs> Good we, we are so talking talk, uh, chalk and cheese I, I see these photos that someone's oh I've, I've done this in photoshop and it's like why bother mm. why have you bothered um, it's a fake look it, it's it's a rep, it's trying to replicate the look, but it's not actually processing it as an IR photo. It's all it's all that's doing is trying to make it look as if it is an IR yeah. photo, which means it's out of focus. It's, there's no detail. It's 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 this wishy washy type of um, snowy effect, and it, it it just doesn't work basically. Mm. Particularly then, particularly if you're actually trying to shoot a black and white photograph. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have the physical, um, well, the physics uh, kind of aspects to it, like being able to look through haze, the, you know, more more contrast and detail and, and clouds and other um, areas that, you know, it's just be really hard to be able to emulate that in all sections oh, yeah. of the image. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's like trying to uh, apply the ND filter app in, instead of actually using an ND filter yes. on the end of your lens. You can tell the difference. And, um, it, yeah, it's just it doesn't work. <laughs> mm, no that's that's um I, I certainly wholeheartedly agree with that and i also really like the um storytelling aspect of shooting in infrared too it's a, there's some sort of romance to the idea of it and and you know 
uh, capturing a totally different light. You've never seen this scene this way before. Um, you know, you might be the first person to go to a place and actually photograph it in, in a different light in infrared. And I think there's a lot of real kind of um, exciting aspects to that. And, and that's all taken away if you're just sort of concocting something up in Photoshop after the fact. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why I enjoy going to places like Iceland and Norway where you, your colour palette is there waiting for you and, and deliberately just ignoring that and shooting just black and white. That's it. And um, probably finally, um, we'll just wrap up on this last question and, and it's probably a good one for anyone that's sort of budding and looking to get into infrared. Um, it's around, you know, shooting with infrared, um, it, you know, does it need a different approach? And, and if, if so, you know, what, um, what would be some good tips to, to really get some great infrared images? Um, okay. You've got to assume that you won't be taking photos at the same time of day with the same light that you would normally take photos. Um, ideally, you're looking early morning um, and late afternoon, but the, the weather has to be nice and crisp. Uh, the air has to be crisp and clean and not, not dirty and no haze and not overcast. There, you've got to have a sun there. Mm. And look where this, what the sun is hitting and what it's doing to the surroundings uh, in terms of the shadows and the shade. Um, and the, the subject as well, a, a lot of the subjects will lend themselves better to IR. For example, a cliff face with your contrast and different tonal values of the rocks, but also you know, your trees as well. And it's, it's not just because... Um, the IR, the deep black and white IR filter will turn the leaves white. It's, it's the whole structure of the tree and what's happening in, in the light that you can capture something I feel more emotive uh, than, than normally with a black and white photo. So, and that's why I put examples, clouds, trees, cityscapes. Mm. These are perfect environments for testing out your IR capabilities. Um, and and it has to be it's, it's all about the light basically yeah there's some days where i look up and see the clouds and i'm just like oh this is an infrared camera day like you could just take photos of whatever you wanted and with that amazing sky there it's just going to make it look fantastic well, so at 6 30 i was out in the garden with the wife and i was looking at the clouds and i think oh I wish I could just grab the camera and head off to Echo Point, but no, I've got to do this damn talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's ironic. Uh, that happens sometimes with auroras for us too. You had the aurora forecast come in. I was like, oh, I've got a show tonight. Oh, well. But, yeah, no, that, we really, really appreciate you joining us, Peter, and, and taking us through the world of infrared. And um, I'm sure for everyone it's been very, very inspiring. And if you haven't dabbled in infrared, then, um, you know, this is a maybe a really nice catalyst to get into it. I actually, I don't know if, I think you've done a bit of a writing primer on uh, infrared um, back in, I don't know if that one on Redbubble that you wrote a while back is still up there or, or anything like that. No, I, I took um, all my tutorials down from yeah. Redbubble. Um, but yeah, I, I have written, uh, and my website's down at the moment, but when I get it back up, I will be republishing uh, those tutorials. Yeah, on, they were really... Yeah. I've also had a stab at it too, so nothing to the level of what Peter had um, written up, but if you go to my website, I've also got a, a bit of an intro to infrared, which is, I think I wrote it for the Australian Photography Magazine a few years ago, so there's a little bit of info there, plenty on, if you go to the LifePixel website, you've probably got all the information you ever need, to be honest, yeah. um, and um, I, I, I think I personally would probably be looking at Camera Clinic as well as a, a conversion option down the track too, given some of the really, really good feedback I've heard, it certainly saves having to send it to, to um, the US to do. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's plenty of options there. Feel free to get in touch uh, with myself um, if you want more info on infrared as well. I'm happy, always happy to chat. And it sounds like there's some really good Facebook groups out there too, if you're wanting to get involved more in the community and that kind of thing as well. Um, all well right. Peter, I'll, uh, be, uh, I'll be waiting for that website to come back up because I'm really looking forward to going a bit deeper into your work after what I've seen tonight. It's, it's yeah, there's some absolutely world-class imagery through there, my friend. Thank you very much. And um, Yeah, it's not super often. I, I, I just end up like, oh, my goodness, I just want to <laughs> dive into this person's work and, 
and really learn some things. And I, I feel like, you know, that this this niche kind of level that you presented at, you know, is 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 really quite exceptional. And uh, the caliber of your compositional mind as well really comes through the your body of work and, and the way you can present a landscape, you know, like like the Eisner work in particular with such depth and such and alacrity also, is is really really astonishing so thank you you yeah, can see like, you, oh god if you if you go on to flickr and and search for me you'll you'll find me there i've, I've got okay good. That'll, that'll be my in between in between that'll that. be your in between <laughs> picks, yeah. and it's very very well worth seeing peter's work in um an exhibition i've seen it a few times and it's and it's always gobsmacking so definitely keep an eye out yeah for, I, um, I didn't start that conversation because of... i was really curious about how you how you ended up printing your work but that's probably a half a show in itself peter so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes yeah, and Peter, Peter's very, um, I know from talking to him, he's very um, methodical and well thought in terms of how he puts his prints out there as well. So there's um, some yeah, insane sense of just, level of why I wanted to ask and also there. why I didn't so, ask. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, look, thanks again, Peter. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, and a um, yeah, um, we next week we have um, Jared Parker. Is it still Paul? Yeah, Jared yeah. Parker. He's uh, He's a wonderful West Australian photographer. Um, he's pretty exceptional up in the air, and, and he sort of wants to. He has a very holistic relationship with photography that that brings a huge amount of well being into his life, and he, and all the way from the idealism, the the, the place it holds in his life, the, the processes he goes through to engage in it, and the balance it brings him. And he also has some really unusual three uh, D printing techniques. I'm really curious to to hear about. So, so we just uh, we just. D- What's the word? Diluting down the gist of it to a title at the moment, but uh, stay tuned. Mm, absolutely, no, it should be great. And um, yeah, well, so we'll catch you all at the same time next week. Um, thanks again, Peter, and um, wishing you all a great night. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, superb. Good night. Man, keep it up. My